This is a brief lecture about significant figures. Significant figures are important in science because they tell us about the precision of a measurement. The more precise a measuring device, the more significant figures you have. So if you see, the bottom line is, if you see one number with a lot of significant figures, let's just make one up, and then you see another number with fewer significant digits, that would mean that the number with more significant digits was measured with a more precise piece of equipment. That's important to scientists. They want to know how much they can rely on a value, and significant figures tells them. It's also important when you carry out calculations to keep track of significant figures. Okay, You don't want to lose the precision of a measurement from sloppy addition or multiplication. All right, before we get going too much further, I want you to understand the difference between accuracy and precision. I've been talking about precision, but what is the difference between these two? This is a really easy difference to mess up. Um, accuracy is how close a value is to what it's supposed to be. Accuracy is how close a value is to what it's supposed to be. Precision is how repeatable the value is. Um, this is, may seem silly to you, but it's how I've remembered it. Accuracy means close. Precision means repeatable. A for accuracy, C for close. They are close to one another in the alphabet, A and C. And P for precision, R for repeatable. P and R are close to one another in the alphabet also. So, um, precision, again, how repeatable it is, is what we're talking about for sig figs. Let's look at some graphs that tell us about the precision and accuracy of some measurements. On these graphs, you can see that along the y-axis is mass. You may not be able to read that in grams. And then for each individual graph, there are four trials or four different experiments. So they're obviously weighing the mass of something four different times. Well, on the piece of equipment they're using for the graph on the left, you can see that they get um, a mass of, what, 10 point whatever grams. The second time they get it's 9.29 grams. And so they're getting quite a bit of scatter um, from one trial to the next and measuring presumably the same item. And so we would say this is not very precise because this, it's not repeatable. And if the value that it is supposed to be is represented by this blue line, these values are, are also not very accurate, okay? Because they're not really very close to that blue line. So this chart recommend, represents inaccurate and imprecise measurements. The second graph represents, uh, look at how repeatable all of these mass values are. Very precise data. However, in addition, or um, aside from it being very precise, all of the values for all four trials are off significantly from the value that it's supposed to be, or the known value, which is that blue line. So even though they are precise measurements, they are not accurate. And finally, the last uh, graph, the one on the far right here, has values that are very repeatable, very close to each other, so they are precise, and they're also very close to this blue line. That's the known value, so they're also accurate. So it's really important that you understand how to interpret different graphical representations of accuracy and precision. Um, I am sure that will probably show up on a quiz or a test. All right, so here's a table form of data. Um, I'm going to give you a minute to, well, actually what I would recommend doing is pausing the video and seeing if you can decide um, which student has the most precise data 
Is it student A or student B or student C? And which data, which student has the most accurate data? See if you can get that right and then turn the video back on and see if you're right. The first thing I always look at is what are the average values for the experiments compared to what the actual value is supposed to be. So if I put another column over here, actual value, that's some known value from a book or whatever, is supposed to be 10.00, okay? Now remember what accuracy is. Accuracy is how close you are, A and C, to the actual value. So which of these students obtained an average value, overall average value, that's closest to the known value? Um, let's see, clearly it was student C. So I would say student C is the most accurate because his average was closest to the known value. Um, who was the least accurate? Who was the farthest away? Well, let's see, student A is a, off by 0.13 grams, and student B is off by, let's see if I can do addition in my head, subtraction in my head, 0.21 grams, okay? So student B is the least accurate. How do we find precision? Okay. Precision is a little bit more in depth. Uh, precision is how repeatable each of the trials are to one another. Okay. So how, how repeatable are each of these four trials for student A, for example? Well, sometimes, sometimes you can kind of eyeball it and tell, but honestly, I really can't in this set of data. So what you do to find precision is you figure out the range. I would be taking notes on this if I were you. What do I mean by range? That means the difference between the largest value, which is 10.49, and the smallest value. So for student A, the smallest value is 9.79. What is the difference there? 0 0.70 grams. Okay. That's the range for student A. What is the range for student B? That range would be, yeah, that's a tighter range, I can tell already by looking. 9.82 minus 9.78. Ooh, yeah, you should be, I guess I should have been able to eyeball this. Wow. Okay. So student B only has a range of 0.04. He has very precise measurements or he used a measuring device that was very precise. So either he or the equipment is, is good. So student C has a range that, let's see, goes from 10.03. And the smallest value that student C has is 9.98. Is that right? No, that's zero. 0.05. Who's the winner? Uh, student B is the most precise, and student A is the least precise. I think I have filled up this page with enough scribbles. All right, so I mentioned this, I think, in the first slide, and it's worth mentioning again. The greater the number of significant figures, the greater the precision of the measurement. So let's compare, for example, let's see. If I have, again, that has four sig figs. And I'll give you the rules so you know how to count sig figs. But just take my word for it now. This number only has one sig fig, OK? So the number with the most sig figs has more precision. All right. So now there are a few rules that you need to know for sig figs. I would probably write these down on a note card or whatever way helps you study. But these rules are going to be really important in this class and the lab that goes along with it and throughout the next semester's lecture and lab also. So it's something you really need to commit to memory and get comfortable with. 
Um, I've tried to simplify the rules. Um, the first one, very easy. Any number that's not a zero is automatically significant. Okay. Zeros that are in between, that are sandwiched in between non-zero numbers, regardless of where they are, the right or left of the decimal, if a zero is in between two non-zero numbers, it is significant. So, so far I've only told you about significant figures. Let's talk about some numbers that are significant. Alright, leading zeros, those are zeros that begin a number are never significant, regardless of how they're presented. Um, you can think of these leading zeros as um, telling us the order of magnitude, or they're kind of placeholders, but they have nothing to do with the precision of a measurement. Okay, Those zeros are going to be there regardless of the equipment you use, because it tells us about the size or the magnitude of a number. The rest of the rules are the critical rules, okay? So far, it should be easy to understand. Trailing zeros, those are zeros at the end of a number, to the far right of a number, okay? Trailing zeros are sometimes significant and sometimes not. The bottom line is, if there is a decimal point anywhere in the number, trailing zeros are always significant. If there's a decimal point any place in the number, trailing zeros are significant. There's a decimal point. Because of that, all of the trailing zeros are significant. And so this number has four significant di digits. If I had written that number like this without a decimal point, it would be only one significant figure. Again, here's a decimal. So these trailing zeros are significant, and there are five significant figures. If I had written that number like this without a decimal point, it would only be two significant figures. Again, there's a decimal point here, so it's five sig figs. There is no decimal point in this bottom number. So there are only two sig figs, the one and the four. The trailing zeros are not significant because there is no decimal. All right, the final thing just kind of to keep in mind is scientific notation. The numbers in the coefficient portion of scientific notation are always significant, regardless of whether they're zeros or non-zeros or whatever. So, and the exponent part, you ignore that for when you're counting sig figs. It has nothing to do, the exponent part has nothing to do with the precision of the equipment or the precision of the measurement. So this number in scientific notation has two sig figs, this has three sig figs, and this number has four sig figs. All right, so just to kind of practice, um, to see whether or not you can, you've kind of absorbed what I've said, if I asked you a general question, what is the difference? What is the importance of the difference between these two measured values? So what I would recommend is, again, turning off the video for a couple minutes and kind of think in your head how you would answer this. Imagine it's a short essay question, and um, it's something that shows you understand the concept. All right, so this is what I would expect if I asked a question like this. First of all, the, nu the number 4.0 has two significant figures. The trailing zero is significant because there's a decimal any place in the number. This particular number, 4.00, has three significant figures. And so 4.00 has more significant figures, which means it is a more precise number, which means it was measured with equipment that's capable of higher precision. Measured with more precise equipment. All right. So basically, the number with more sig figs, not only is it more precise, it's more reliable, more repeatable, okay? 
Think of the definition for significant figures. It means more um, precision. All right, so that's the type of answer I would expect for this question. Here is the textbook answer, so you can read that over, a little bit more official language. And onward. The last little topic we're going to go into in this lecture is carrying out calculations and maintaining the correct number of significant figures. So there is one rule when you add and subtract, and there's a second different rule when you multiply and divide. So let's do the addition and subtraction rule first. What I like to do when I'm adding and subtracting, at least when I'm teaching how to do it, is to line up the addition or the subtraction in vertical form. And the rule basically says that the numbers that you're adding or subtracting look at how many numbers to the right of the decimal. That's all that matters when you're counting sig figs when you're adding and subtracting. So this first number has three digits to the right of the decimal. The second number has two digits to the right of the decimal. Doesn't matter if those digits are significant or not. Just You're just counting digits now. This third number has one, two, three, four digits to the right. So if we are to just randomly add all the numbers and don't worry about sig figs, we would get the answer, or your calculator would spit out the answer shown here. But that's not how you would report the answer with the correct number of sig figs. What determines how many sig figs is the number with the fewest digits to the right of the decimal. Ooh boy, that wasn't good, was it? The number with the fewest digits to the right of the decimal. So this one only had 0.07, only has two digits to the right of the decimal, which means your answer can only have two digits to the right of the decimal. So the correct answer expressed with the right number of sig figs is 5.41. That'll be really important throughout this course. And again, these are only for values that are measured. If you're just talking about pure math and it doesn't involve a scientific measurement, you really don't have to worry about sig figs. The same rule applies when you subtract. So let's go ahead and look at this problem on the right. How many digits to the right of the decimal? One. How many digits does the second number have to the right of the decimal? Three. So again, it's the number with the fewest digits to the right of the decimal that determines how many digits to the right of the decimal the answer must have. So even though your calculator will spit out this answer when it's subtracted, we can only have one digit to the right of the decimal. Okay, So you might ask, well, why wasn't it 5.6 then? This is a very important point. You need to round correctly. Okay, And that means look at the last digit that's going to be included for significant figures, and that's right here, the first digit to the right of the decimal. Then you need to look to the right, one to the right of that last digit you're including. If this number is 5 or above, you need to round up, which is what we did here. If the number to the right of the last digit you're keeping is less than 5, in other words, if it's 1, 2, 3, 4, or 0, um, you're going to keep the number where it's at. So we will report this answer as 5.7. Multiply and dividing, or actually I think the rule is much more simple. Um, instead of counting how many digits to the right of the decimal, you actually count total significant figures in each of the numbers that you're either multiplying or dividing. So this first number has 4, the second has 5, and the third number only has 2. The, the number that has the fewest sig figs in it is going to determine how many sig figs your answer has. Since you have a number that only has two sig figs, your answer can only have two sig figs. So again, when you plug in all these numbers to your calculator, your calculator is going to spit out 6.7208. Um, but again, we know we can only use two significant figures. 
So we keep the first two numbers, check the first number to the right and make sure that you don't have to round that 7 up. We don't because it's a 2. And so 6.7 is our correct answer. Same rule for dividing. <clears throat> this number, the first number, has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 sig figs. The second number has 3 sig figs. 3.20 or 3 sig figs is the fewest number of sig figs, so our answer can only have 3 sig figs. So again, we go to the number our calculator spits out, include the first 3 sig figs, and that's 0.626. We can't include any more digits, but we do look at the first number to the right of the last digit we kept and make sure that we don't have to round up. Since it's a zero, we don't. So our final answer is 0.626. You'll need to practice this quite a bit because there are some little glitches here and there that you kind of will need to be able to iron out. So it's, it's going to be really important to practice some of these problems. All right, um, a couple of exceptions here. If there's something that wasn't measured but is just known as a fact, for example, you have five fingers on each hand, so or a dog has four legs um, most of the time. Okay, no, no smart aleck remarks here. So if you, if a multiplication or division or addition or subtraction involves what we call a counting number a number that is known exactly with no uncertainty, and, and it usually hasn't been, well, it hasn't been measured, um, then it doesn't get taken into account as far as determining sig figs. So if I said there are uh, seven dogs in a room, and each dog has four legs, there are four legs per one dog, okay, you would say there are 28 legs total in that room. So if you were blindly trying to follow the rules of sig figs, you might say, well, let's see, 7 has one sig fig, 4 has one sig fig, so I can only have one sig fig in my ants. answer, and you might mess with that number, mess it up. But no, because Seven dogs, that is a counting number. There are precisely seven dogs. There cannot be 6.8 dogs or 7.3 dogs. You can count each individual one and they're not measured. Therefore, seven, as in dogs, has an infinite number of significant figures. You don't limit it when you calculate it with it. Same thing with four legs. You can count the four legs in each dog. So it has unlimited or infinite sig figs and you don't limit how you express your answer because of that. Another type of perfect number or exact number would be conversions that are defined exactly. So somebody who ever came up with a metric system decided that 100 centimeters was exactly and totally equal to one meter. Okay, So it's never going to be 98.6 centimeters equal one meter. So that is an exact number. So when you're doing a calculation with it, don't take it into account when you're counting sig figs. Don't look at that number and say there's only one sig fig because it doesn't matter. It's an exact number. So when determining how many sig figs an answer should have, you look at only the number that has been measured that is not an exact number. So this number was measured, it's got three sig figs, so your answer should have three sig figs. Alrighty, so I already kind of mentioned rounding in general, but another thing I want to say about rounding is let's say you do a multiple step calculation. So for example, in this problem, you would subtract in the first step and then you would multiply in the second step so don't do any rounding or counting sig figs until you get to the very end because that'll like artificially truncate your answer and, and you'll end up getting it off a bit from what it should be. So in other words, don't carry out this subtraction and then round that before you multiply. Do the subtraction, multiply everything, and then round at the very end. 
So that's just repeating what I just said. All right, so <clears throat> again, um, just some practice on rounding. Um, that's something you probably should do a few problems on too just to make sure you get it. Let's say if I gave you a problem and this is likely to show up on a quiz or test also, if I give you a bunch of numbers and say round all of them to two significant figures, what you're going to do, let's look at this first one, 5.37. You literally, you want to round it to two sig figs, so you take the first two significant figures, 5 and 3. You're going to drop any of them that show up after that, but you, when you drop it, you cannot ignore rounding. Since the number, your first number you're dropping is a 7, it's, it's 5 or greater, that means the 3 must be rounded up to a 4. Um, 5.34, again, two sig figs would be the 5 and 3 again, but in this case, since the first number you crossed out is less than 5, we do not round up, it stays 5.3. Um, again, if the num first number you cross out is a 5 or greater, you're going to round up the number before it, so that becomes 5.4. <laughs> this number can mess a lot of people up because how you're supposed to do it is look only at the first number to the right, the first number that you dropped. It is a 4, which means this 3 does not get rounded up. But some people will say, well, but here's a 9. Wouldn't that 9 make the 4 go to a 5? And No, don't do that chain reaction thing. Just look at the, number, the first number you drop. And that is it for significant figures.